So I'd, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone for coming tonight. This is the first of uh, three virtual talks on diabetes that we've organized uh, for patients. My name is Lionel Morona. I'm a family physician in Southeastern Ontario. I have a passion for continuing medical education and an interest in diabetes. And I've had the pleasure to participate, give and help develop many medical education events over the years, especially in diabetes. One thing I noticed is that physicians are usually giving talks to other clinicians and rarely directly to patients. So I thought there was an opportunity to here to uh, have a talk from uh, a, a well-known respected clinician directly to patients, not just to educate them, but empower them and inspire them to take control of their illness. So with the help of a superb team, just less than two months ago, we decided to put these talks together. And uh, this is your opportunity to, you know, hear from an expert in diabetes, uh, participate through the chat, we'll have questions and answers as we go on mainly at the end. I'd like to uh, mention that these talks are completely non-promotional um, and we've raised some funding through companies uh, via honorarius for the speakers, but the speakers have donated all of this completely uh, and it'll be channeled to the nonprofit entity Diabetes Canada, which is committed to serving patients with diabetes. Um, I ask you to please don't be shy with your questions. Type them into the question and answer uh, icon at the bottom. It's anonymous. There are no bad questions. And you know, if you're brave enough to ask a question, I'll, I'll ask it on your behalf to Dr. Cheng. And uh, I'm sure other people will benefit from your asking that. Um, so our, with that having been said, uh, our first talk tonight is an overview of what diabetes is what you can do about it, and how you can really change the devastating outcomes that come with this illness. Um, our speaker tonight is Dr. Alice Chang. Uh, she's a dedicated clinician with a love of educating. Beyond her brilliance, she has a wonderful speaking style. Now I'm gonna give you the Coles Notes introduction for her without her many achievements and awards. So Dr. Chang is an endocrinologist at Trillium Health Partners, Credit Valley, in Mississauga, and St. Meg's Hospital. She's an associate professor at the University of Toronto, and she was the chair of the Diabetes Canada Clinical Practice Guidelines. And I'll bet I could say this probably the youngest ever to do that. So without any further ado, Dr. Chang, take it away. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Naronia, for that kind introduction and, and a huge thanks to you for really coming up with this idea, creating, having the vision and making it come to life. And, and pulling us together to be part of the speaking series. And it's certainly my honor to be, to be part of this. So thank you. Thank you, Lionel, for, uh, for putting the effort to, to create this. And welcome to all of you tonight uh, for joining this session. Uh, by virtue of you being here, I'm going to safely assume that diabetes is an area of interest for everyone who is listening, either because you yourself have diabetes or a loved one does or a good friend does. Uh, or you're just curious about the topic and would like to learn more about it. So mine, as, as Dr. Naronia mentioned, is, is the first of a series of talks. So I'm going to give a, somewhat of an overview about what is diabetes, what are the different types of diabetes. And I uh, have left lots of time for questions at the end and would certainly encourage all of you to attend the other talks that are scheduled uh, in this series that is meant for you. Now you can see on this title that it says insulin 100 on the bottom there next to the University of Toronto. And, and as many of you may know, this is the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin. And it's a little controversial as to exactly which year one should pick, uh, but this is the year that most have picked. And 100 years ago was when insulin was discovered on the grounds of the University of Toronto and truly was life-saving for millions of people around the world who uh, lived with type one diabetes. And that impact is really immeasurable because people whose lives would have been cut short were not because of the discovery of insulin. And then they of course impacted the world and likely had children who then impacted the world. So really the magnitude of benefit is truly immeasurable and we are forever grateful for this. Having said all that though, I heard this from a colleague recently, we are hoping that we will not be celebrating this in another hundred years. I mean, you and I won't be around, but in terms of the future people and that hopes will be discussions around cure, uh, certainly of type one diabetes uh, by that period of time. So the questions that I'm gonna go through with you tonight are how common is, I guess I'll start with what is diabetes followed by how common is diabetes? What are the different types of diabetes? How does one diagnose diabetes? Why do we care? How do we treat? 
and where can you get more information? So let's start off with what is diabetes. Now you may look at this and go, my goodness, why is she showing me pictures of ants on the ground? And uh, some of you may in fact know the story around this. And back in the ancient, ancient times, one of the ways that diabetes was recognized was actually through sweet urine. And uh, how can you tell that urine is sweet? I'm just changing the picture because not everybody likes ants. Uh, you can tell the urine is sweet is that if someone were to urinate, let's say on the pavement, and the ants were to go to the urine, then that would be a sign of sweet urine. And in fact, in the way early days, there was actually one of the jobs of physicians was to actually taste urine and be able to determine if someone had the diagnosis of diabetes. Now, thankfully, we have moved far away from needing to use a cup like this in order to taste urine to determine if someone does in fact have diabetes. And we have far better ways now to measure if someone does have elevated sugar in their blood. And back in the first century AD, diabetes was described as the melting down of flesh and limbs into the urine. And where does the term diabetes mellitus come from? Well, diabetes means siphon. Siphon means flowing through. So there was a recognition that people with diabetes would have significant urination. They'd be peeing all the time. So water was flowing through them but the water flowing through them was sweet, hence the addition of the word mellitus. So a, a sweet urine was the definition of what we now call diabetes. And for those of you who like medical jeopardy or medical trivia, there actually is a disease called diabetes insipidus. And in diabetes insipidus, there is also a flowing through of urine and those patients have lots of urination, but their urine is insipid or very clear. And it's a completely different disorder, has absolutely nothing to do with glucose or sugar at all, but you can see where the words were in fact derived from. So what we commonly refer to as diabetes is actually diabetes mellitus, which is of course the one involving excess glucose or sugar in the blood. So therefore it's a chronic disease in which a person has high blood sugars either because of the body not responding properly to insulin or, and the body not making enough insulin. So how does insulin factor into this? Well, insulin is a hormone that your pancreas makes and its job is actually a storage hormone. So insulin's job is to take glucose, sugar in the blood and put it away for future usage as a storage. However, if insulin is either being ignored, which is the first situation, so not responding properly to insulin, or one is not making enough insulin, then that storage fuel of glucose is not being put away, but is being left around in the blood, and therefore you end up with high blood sugar. So diabetes, therefore, is a chronic disease in which the person has high blood sugars due to body not responding to insulin and or body not making enough insulin. And this is important to understand because the therapies that we offer for diabetes really circle around this concept of amount of glucose in the blood as well as how to manipulate circulating insulin or the effectiveness of the body's use of insulin. So how common is diabetes? Needless to say, the answer is common, but what kind of numbers are we talking about? So these are data from the International Diabetes Federation from 2019, and every two years, the IDF goes through uh, a world atlas. So it takes a look at the different regions of the world and gives us kind of a report card of how we're doing in terms of diabetes, its prevalence and change over time. And you can see some of the infographic statistics that were put out in the 2019 atlas. So one in 11 adults, 463 million people around the world diagnosed with diabetes, but also a strong recognition that there is a large percentage of people out there that are undiagnosed with diabetes. Over three in four people with diabetes live in low and middle income countries. So this is clearly an issue that is not isolated to just developed countries, but also to emerging countries and is a growing problem 
And the cost of it is clearly huge. That middle, middle infographic tells us US dollars, $760 billion spent on diet. I mean, I can't even wrap my brain around how much money that is. And then other statistics are shown for you on this infographic. But clearly this is a common issue. It is not just a Canadian one or a North American one, but it is in fact a global issue. And just looking at the world map, these are the number of people, these are just the adults, age 20 to 79, who have been diagnosed with diabetes worldwide based on different regions of the world. And you can also see the percent increase that is predicted. 2019 is the lowest number in each of the categories up to 2045, year 2045. And you can see that in North America and the Caribbean on the top left, there's a 33% increase that's expected. But I think what's concerning is when you take a look at Africa or you take a look at Middle East and North Africa, we're looking at a 143% increase and a 96% increase. And if you look at Southeast Asia on the far right, it's a 74% predicted increase. So this is a problem and this is a problem that is growing and escalating in many parts of the world and therefore something we need to all pay attention to. And shown in a different way, these are the estimates and the projections of the global prevalence of diabetes, again, in that adult age group of 20 to 79, shown here in millions. And you can see that the, the green, sorry, excuse me, the blue represents the estimates, and then the orange represents the projections. So we are tracking, unfortunately, on a trajectory that is quite frightening. So a, a concern that all of us need to take very seriously. And how are we doing here at home in Canada? And these are some of the latest statistics that we have. 3.9 million Canadians diagnosed with diabetes. 11.5 million Canadians felt to have diabetes and pre-diabetes. And this also includes the estimated who have undiagnosed diabetes. And that translates into 3.96 billion Canadian dollars being spent on diabetes. A very important chronic illness that again, we need to all pay attention to. So knowing what it is, knowing that it is common, what are the different types of diabetes? Because there's certainly lots of myths out there and, and a lot of things that people say to others who are diagnosed with diabetes. And some of you probably have your own pet peeves that you're welcome to share with us in the, in the chat or the Q&A. But a lot of those uh, things that people say to you that are wrong and frankly annoying are due to misinformation and simply not understanding what are the different types of diabetes. So to try to illustrate that, I thought I would show you some faces that you may be familiar with. So these are three famous people that you will hopefully be able to identify. So we have Nick Jonas up on the top, Halle Berry on the bottom left and Theresa May on the bottom right. And all of these individuals have in common the fact that they all share type one diabetes. So what is type one diabetes? Well, type one diabetes makes up about 10% of the diabetes population and is a situation in which one's pancreas is not able to make enough insulin. So therefore, these people need insulin to live. When we talk about when Banting and Best and Collip and McLeod discovered insulin 100 years ago, who benefited at that time? It was those living with type 1 diabetes, because prior to that discovery, type 1 diabetes was a death sentence. However, after the discovery of insulin, clearly people with type 1 diabetes live long, healthy lives and very productive lives and often free of complications. So the, the discovery of insulin has been huge and type one diabetes is a situation in which insulin is not being made and therefore one must take the insulin in order to live. And then we've got these three famous people here. So we've got Larry King, Tom Hanks, Randy Jackson, and what they have in common are type two diabetes. So what is type two diabetes? Type two diabetes is a situation whereby the body is not responding to insulin properly and then on top of that, the pancreas is not able to make enough insulin to overcome that resistance. So there's two issues going on at the same time. Insulin resistance, where the body's not using the insulin properly, and then inadequate insulin production, 
and therefore the two together result in elevated blood sugars. And this makes up about 90% of the diagnoses of diabetes in the general population. And then there's a third type here shown here with uh, Selma Hayek and Mariah Carey, and both of them had gestational diabetes. And this is diabetes that is diagnosed and usually limited to pregnancy itself. And that's because pregnancy and the placenta make hormones that increase the insulin resistance. And if your pancreas is not able to keep up with that extra demand, then that shows up in pregnancy because of the higher demand, but your pancreas can't keep up, so then your sugars go up. But once the placenta is delivered, that increased demand is gone, your pancreatic function is sufficient. But what this tells us is that your pancreas is not 100% normal. It's not quite able to ramp up production when needed. Therefore, your future risk of type 2 diabetes is present. But in the vast majority of people living with or who've experienced gestational diabetes, the diabetes goes away upon delivery. However, one is at high risk of developing type 2 diabetes in the future. Now, one of the misperceptions that's out there is that one type of diabetes is more severe than the other, or one type is worse than the other. And you hear people say things like, oh, so you have the, you have the worst type, uh, or even uh, I think that is much more detrimental is you hear people say things like, oh, well, type two is the one you could have prevented, but you failed to prevent. And that one I think annoys me the most, I have to say, <laughs> because Nobody is asking for diabetes in any of these situations. And the number one predictor of who is going to get diabetes is genetics. We cannot change our genetics. Genetics were the hand dealt to us. We, we had nothing to do with it. We cannot change it. It was passed down. And if genetics is the biggest predictor of who's going to get diabetes or not, then to place blame on the person who then develops diabetes makes absolutely no sense and could actually just result in a lot of detriment and a lot of issues with self-esteem, which will then spiral into other negative impact. So therefore, number one, please don't blame anybody you know or yourself if you in fact develop diabetes. You are not to blame. This is a genetic disorder that does have some lifestyle contribution to it, but it's still primarily genetic in nature. Now, is there a worse type of diabetes? No, that's another term that I find not helpful at all because there is no worse type, there is no better type. It is about different type requires different treatments, but the end goal is no different. The end goal is to control the glucose, the sugar, so that the sugar will not stick to things in the body, which will then not cause the complications that can come from having diabetes. That is the end goal. And the end goal is to try to achieve that while still living your life and while still enjoying life and trying to achieve the things you want to achieve in life. So therefore, part of our goal as a diabetes community is to help lessen the burden of diabetes at the same time as supporting people living with diabetes to control their diabetes so that it's not the other way around. So I think for those of you who have diabetes, you've probably had friends or family say things that you didn't appreciate. For those of you who do not have diabetes, but have friends or family with diabetes, just be conscious of what you're saying, uh, be conscious of the impact that that may have. And if you have questions, please ask them tonight so that we can address them and try to dispel some of those myths that are in fact out there. So since I feel well, I cannot have diabetes. Now this is a, a misperception that can in fact be out there in the community. And that is why there is a large percentage of people with undiagnosed diabetes. And this is a false statement. You do not feel your diabetes until the sugar is quite high or you have developed complications from diabetes itself, which is why we do recommend that screening take place. And screening takes place by a blood test and it's recommended roughly every three years at the age of 40 or older or at a younger age, if you have any risk factors for diabetes. And these are some of the risk factors we consider. Age, we've already talked about. If you have a first degree relative with diabetes, so if you have a mother, father, brother, sister with diabetes, that's a reason to screen earlier. If you come from a high risk population, so what does that mean? To put it very bluntly, it would seem like every sort of non-white ethnicity would be a considered a higher risk population. 
And that's because when we look from an ethnicity perspective, the possibility of developing type 2 diabetes does seem to be higher in those ethnicities. And again, genetics, remember what I said, this is primarily an issue of genetics and the cards one was dealt. So therefore, uh, with those particular ethnicities is higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes. From a type 1 diabetes perspective, it's not clear if there actually is any ethnic variability. We know that we can find type 1 diabetes in every ethnicity out there. If you already have prediabetes, so you already have some elevation in your blood sugars, well then of course you are at risk of moving forward and actually progressing to diabetes itself. If you have any complications already from diabetes, which we'll talk about later, any heart disease, stroke, circulation problems, then yes, you should be screened for diabetes since diabetes is a risk factor for these things to develop. If you had diabetes in your pregnancy when you were younger, then absolutely you should be screened regularly for diabetes. If you have other risk factors like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, if you have a big waist. So if you have an increased waist circumference, and for males, we're talking about 90 centimeters, and for females, 80 centimeters. And that's the waist measured at the, the middle point between the bottom of your rib cage and the top of your hip bone. If you take a tape measure and measure yourself parallel to the ground, and you're greater than those numbers, then yeah, you should be screened for diabetes at a younger age. If you are a woman who has been having irregular periods because of something called polycystic ovarian syndrome, then you are at risk of type two diabetes. If you have certain mental health illnesses such as schizophrenia, you are at increased risk. And then finally, if you have something called acanthosis nigricans. Now, what is acanthosis nigricans? And for those of you who know Latin, you would probably be able to guess what this is. So acanthosis nigricans is this. It is a darkening of the skin, armpits, that's what the picture is on the far left, back of the neck, which is the picture on the far right. It almost looks like dirt on the back of the neck and uh, it's sort of velvety to the touch, although really I can't tell much of a difference when I examine it. It's really just looks like dirt on the neck, looks like dirt on your armpits. But that is actually a sign of insulin resistance. And if you do have acanthosis nigricans, I would certainly be asking my doctor, have I been checked for diabetes? Now, although you may not have symptoms and already have elevated sugars, it is possible that the sugars get high enough that you actually develop symptoms. So what are those symptoms? Those are shown for you here. And the most common ones are that of being super thirsty and peeing all the time. So what we call polydipsia, which means drinking a lot, and polyuria, which means peeing a lot. So being very thirsty, peeing a lot, um, blurry vision because the sugar levels in the blood are high, and then the lens of the eye has liquid in it. And then it's through osmosis tries to equilibrate and that messes up the amount of liquid in the lens, which then messes up your vision and causes blurry vision. Uh, drowsiness could be there with extremely high sugars. Most patients don't have all of the above, but these are some of the potential symptoms of high blood sugar. But to get these symptoms, you actually have to have quite high blood sugars. And likely you've already had diabetes for some time prior to that, that may not have been recognized. So how do we diagnose diabetes then? We do so with blood tests. And the blood test then is either a fasting blood sugar and the magic number is seven. So a fasting glucose of seven or greater is considered diabetes, or we can also do a blood test called the A1C. Now the A1C is a measure of how much sugar is stuck on your red blood cells. So it's the percentage of your red blood cells or hemoglobin that's got sugar stuck on it. And if your A1C is 6.5% or greater, then that is again considered diagnostic for diabetes. But remember that there is a pre-diabetes stage and that pre-diabetes stage is, is the number sort of just below these values, which indicate that your sugar handling is not normal. It hasn't quite crossed that line in the sand yet, but you're heading in the wrong direction. And interventions like lifestyle modifications can be very important at that time. The other kind of test that might be done, not commonly done, but could be done, particularly when pregnant, these are the, the tests, the test of choice, is actually an oral glucose tolerance test. So an oral glucose tolerance test, consider it a, a challenge test or a stress test for your pancreas. Because what happens is that you, you're fasting, you go to the lab, you get a blood test drawn, 
And then you are given this disgusting 75 grams of oral glucose, which is, if, if you think about the McDonald's orange juice that uh, we may have had as kids at birthday parties, just make that a little bit sweeter and then have to drink a lot of it. So imagine what that tastes like and you drink that quickly. So 75 grams of pure sugar, and then you sit there for two hours and you get another blood drawn. And you can see how this is a stress test for your pancreas to see, is it able to handle that glucose load? And that number based on the two hour value will be able to also diagnose diabetes. But why do we care, right? What, what is the need to diagnose diabetes? Well, the need to diagnose diabetes is because diabetes can affect a number of things. It can affect the eyes, it can affect the kidneys, it can affect the nerves, it can increase the risk of foot problems, it can increase the risk of stroke, circulation issues, and heart disease. Now, all of these things are not appreciated when patients develop it because obviously they can affect quality of life and high blood sugars chronically can increase the risk of developing these things. However, the key is that those risks can be reduced. And that is why it is so important that people identify when they have diabetes and then put into place the treatments that will reduce the risk of complications. One of the reasons I went in into endocrinology was because I can help diagnose something, but I can also help the person living with it manage the disease and actually prevent complications. Unlike some other specialties out there where we diagnose things, but there's nothing we can do about it. This is not the case in diabetes. We can diagnose this and yes, there's something we can do about it. We cannot cure it, but what we can do is definitely control it. So how do we go about doing that? Well, we go about doing that by controlling multiple things and sugar is just one piece of the puzzle. So yes, we wanna control the sugar. Yes, we wanna control blood pressure. We also wanna control cholesterol. So we wanna control the things that we know can contribute to those complications developing. We also know that there are certain medications that have been proven to reduce complications for the heart and the kidneys. And those medications should be used as well in order to independently protect those organs while you're working on controlling the sugar, the blood pressure and the cholesterol. And then the other important part is regular exams to look for complications should they develop because the earlier we catch them, again, the more that we can do. So that means seeing your eye care professional on a regular basis, usually every one to three years, depending on where you are at with the diabetes journey. Regular foot care, which is entirely in the place of the person living with diabetes. And then also yearly urine testing through your doctor to check for any protein in the urine, which was an early sign of some kidney effect. So these, this is the approach that we would want everybody with diabetes to think about. And then of course, stopping smoking. If you are a smoker, then smoking is like adding gas to a flame if the flame is diabetes, because smoking will accelerate the complications of diabetes. And this is one thing that one can work on to lower that risk. So what are the things one can do to control the sugar? Well, I think food is obviously an important component to the management of diabetes. Now this is true in type one diabetes. This is particularly true in type two diabetes, but I would argue that the advice that's shown here is really something we should all be thinking about diabetes or not. It's the concept of portion control. Now I am not a dietitian, so I'm certainly not gonna sit here and pretend to be and uh, give any advice beyond my expertise, but this I am comfortable advising my patients on because it, it, it makes sense and it's already a big change for many people. So I want all of you sitting at home to make a fist. So your fist is probably a different size than my fist. And what I love about this handy portion guide is that it's a personalized measuring cup. So your fist, one fist, is this amount of grains, starches, fruit that you want to have in a meal. So the amount of carbohydrate in a meal. Two handfuls together, two hands together. That's the amount of vegetables that you would like to have in a meal, sort of a heaping, heaping mound. One palm, thickness of a deck of cards is the amount of protein, usually meat. 
doesn't have to be meat though, protein that you would choose to have. And then tip of your thumb in terms of fat. So this would be a, a handy portion guide. And like I said, this does not replace the advice a dietitian is going to give you. But what this does though, is it's a starting point for many people because what most people do is have handfuls of carbs, rice, pasta, bread, whatever the case may be, maybe a palm of vegetables. And then if you're a big meat eater, there might even be two handfuls of meat. That is the usual portion size that many people grew up with. So even this alone at the beginning, when I'm speaking to patients before they can meet a dietitian, this is very powerful. Physical activity, be it with type one or type two diabetes or gestational diabetes, this is important to know about. This is what one aims for, aims for 150 minutes per week, ideally spread over the week, containing resistance as well as aerobic exercise and trying not to sit for extended periods of time, which is particularly hard during this pandemic as people are working from home. But really what I tell people is this, standing is better than sitting, walking is better than standing, walking fast is better than walking slow, walking upstairs is better than walking on the flat, and if you can, running is better than, than, than walking. So in other words, whatever makes sense to you, any movement is good movement. Housework is exercise. So if you wanted to time your vacuuming for after a meal to help control that blood sugar excursion after the meal, great. You're getting your chores done and you're getting exercise at the same time. Uh, walking to work, if that's an option in the future when we go back to work, that may be something one can do. So there are, are simple things one can do. It does not mean you have to join a gym. It does not mean you have to run a marathon. It, as I said, standing better than sitting, walking better than standing, and then walking faster better than walking slower. That's what we're talking about. And then of course, medications have a role as well. And this diagram is really just to show you the complexity of all the different players that contribute to hyperglycemia, which means elevated sugar in the blood. There can be an issue with the pancreas as shown on the top left. And then within the pancreas, something with the islet or the alpha cells, you can have a problem with the liver that's shown on the, on the bottom left, not a problem, but your liver makes too much sugar. In the middle on the bottom, there could be a brain thing where the neurotransmitters aren't functioning normally so that the, the, the hunger signals are not quite appropriate. On the bottom right, the muscles are, are not quite taking up sugar properly. In the middle on the right, the kidneys are uh, reabsorbing too much sugar into the blood. And then on the, on the top right, you've got fat cells that are also making hormones that's making that insulin resistance. And then in the middle, you've also got your gut that's making certain hormones that's also contributing to this. So there's multiple players in this. And food choices and physical activity affect these different components, as do a whole slew of medications. Now, these are just the classes of medications. These aren't even the names of the individual meds within the classes. But I'm showing you this only to say that there are many tools in our toolbox now to help lower blood sugars. It is never in place of diet and exercise. It is always in conjunction with food choices and physical activity. So therefore, whenever you feel like someone is jumping straight to medications, please always ask the question, why? Because remember, there's another thing I mentioned earlier. Some of our medications now have been shown to reduce heart attack, strokes, death, and protect the kidneys independent of the sugar. So that's why some medications may be suggested, even though you're working hard on the food and the physical acti activity piece. So remember, some of our glucose loading medications have actually been shown to not just lower glucose, but to also save lives. And therefore, I've actually introduced these medications to my patients as to say, this is a medication that's been shown to reduce your risk of a heart attack, a stroke, dying, heart failure, kidney problems. And then as a bonus, it's gonna lower your sugar and help you lose some weight. But really, I'm giving it to you to protect your organs. So as long as you have a heart, as long as you got a brain and as long as you got kidneys, this is going to be a good idea to continue because of the protection that it can afford. So what are those medications? These are the six we have available in Canada that have that kind of evidence behind them. And these are the classes that they fall into. You may want to take a picture of this slide when I'm done. The three on the left are oral medications. The three on the right are either injections once weekly or daily oral. They come in different doses. 
And the cost is obviously going to be quite different depending on where you live in Canada, there may, there may be provincial coverage and the side effect profile is also different. But the benefits of both of these classes is of course lowering sugar, but also helping weight loss and also helping reduce blood pressure. But most importantly though, heart, brain, kidney protection. So when we're trying to make decisions about medications to manage sugar, remember, not in place of, but in addition to food choices and physical activity, we ask the question, number one question is, has this person had a heart attack or heart failure or stroke or circulation problem or kidney problem? In other words, do they have any kind of cardiovascular or kidney issue? Because if they do, we know that we must use one of those therapies I mentioned in the previous slide, regardless of their blood sugar, because of the protection they provide, and then we consider other things. So when we're considering other things, what do we ask? Well, we ask, okay, well, how high are the sugars? In other words, how far do we have to go? Is there a risk for this person of having too low of a sugar? Because while we want to control the sugar and keep it from being high, we also do not want it to go too low. Too low is usually defined as under four. And the reason is because too low does not feel good. Too low can cause confusion. And therefore, if one uh, was frail or, uh, or living alone or had any cognitive impairment, then that could be difficult for that person. We consider the weight because if someone's looking for weight loss, then there's certain medications we'd prefer over others. We need to consider their kidney function. We need to, very importantly, do you have coverage? Because depending on where you live in Canada, there's different provincial coverage. And if you're working, what kind of plan your, your company provides. And then of course, whatever it is that the person wants is what we're gonna to need to seriously consider when making decisions about what therapies make sense. So what can you do at your next appointment? So what I would like all of you to do is to think about, document and ask about your A, B, C, D, E, S's. A is for A1C, which is the blood test that looks at how much sugar is stuck on your red blood cells. Your red blood cells live for three months and your target is an A1C less than 7%. Now that target is true for the vast majority of you with diabetes. For some of you, your, your target may actually be under 6.5%. And for some of you, it may actually be higher. So obviously it needs to be individualized, but for the vast majority, the target is under 7%. You wanna ask about what is my blood pressure? And the target is less than 130 over 80. You wanna ask what is my LDL cholesterol? LDL is the bad cholesterol. You want that to be under two. You wanna be asking about drugs to protect your heart. And there are certain specific agents that have been shown to be protective of your heart. And I'm gonna to add to that now kidneys. Exercise eating, we have already talked about. Stopping smoking. Screening for complications, making sure you're seeing the eye care professional every one to three years, that you're taking care of your feet, you're looking at your feet, and that you're getting your urine tested at least once a year. And then the other thing you should be asking is, can I simplify my regimen? Because one of the things that I think my patients hate the most is having lots and lots of pills, of course. Feels like you're having a meal when you're taking all your pills, but there are things we can do to help. There are combinations of pills that are available to reduce the number of pills that you're having to swallow. So there are things that your doctor can do, but sometimes we just need a bit of reminding. Uh, so therefore never hurt to ask us, hey, is there anything you can do with my meds? Uh, not in terms of reducing my medications per se, because I may be on them for protection, but the number of pills that I take, is there a way that we can do something about that? So it's always worth asking. And to give you some hope, there's lots of new things down the pipeline as well. So there are better insulins, longer insulins. We're gonna get even faster insulins. Uh, we've got different ways to measure glucose now. So poking your finger to measure the glucose is now no longer the only way to measure sugar. Uh, there's uh, sensors you can place on your arm and scan with a phone or with a reader. Uh, there's sensors you can place elsewhere on your body that will automatically measure your sugar and, and tell it to your phone and send you alarms if your numbers are either too high or too low. So there's some great technology available out there. And for those of you who may use insulin pump therapy, 
there are better technologies there, better insulin pumps, more automation, where the pump talks to the sensor, the sensor talks to the pump, and there's some decisions being made by computer algorithms, which all of these are being created to try to lower the burden of diabetes itself. Where can you get more information? Of course, I'm gonna direct you to the Diabetes Canada website. So at www.diabetes.ca, uh, there's some fantastic tools that have been created here uh, for people living with diabetes. If you're a healthcare provider, there are great tools created here, uh, including the guidelines, of course, uh, that uh, are meant for healthcare providers. Uh, but please uh, visit the site, uh, read stuff on it, know that it's coming from a trusted source. Uh, there are some good COVID-19 information that's there as well. And, and get involved, get involved with Diabetes Canada, uh, help raise funds, donate if you can, and, and support the mission uh, of Diabetes Canada itself. And finally, I, I want to remind you that for those of you who do have diabetes, you want to have a team that's helping you. you. You are the center of the team and you make the final decisions always. But around you, surround yourself with people you like and, and people who are going to help support you. And that's going to include a diabetes nurse, a dietitian, uh, your pharmacist, uh, your physician. Now your physician, your nurse practitioner from a primary care perspective, uh, some of you may also have an endocrinologist involved. Some of you may have other specialists involved like cardiologists or nephrologists. Uh, you also want to involve um, a family and friends because your support system is actually quite critical. And if you are part of that support system, educate yourself about diabetes so that you don't, out of goodness of your heart, inadvertently say things which end up being detrimental uh, to the person that you're trying to care for. So to summarize, Diabetes is common and it is impactful on the world stage and certainly here in Canada, but there are lots of things available to help. We've got lots of tools, great research. We fully understand diabetes a lot better now. Know that genetics is by far the biggest predictor of who is going to de develop diabetes. Yes, lifestyle issues can contribute and modifying food choices and physical activity can be helpful in managing diabetes. Uh, but so are medications, insulin if necessary. And it's important to remember that our ultimate goal is to reduce complications. And that's gonna happen through a multifactorial approach, which would be the A, B, C, D, E, S's. And of course, diabetes.ca is gonna be your tool to help navigate some of this. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention. And I've left uh, lots of time for questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing here. And then uh, Lionel and I will show up on your screen, hopefully, and uh, take it away, Dr. Neronia, and let's uh, address some of the questions that have come up. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Cheng. Uh, you know, I, I knew it was gonna be brilliant and you are. I think one of the testaments to a great speaker is this, you can speak to a thousand people, a thousand clinicians at a prime med conference and make it very clear and you can speak to, you know, dozens of uh, diabetics directly and make it very clear. So that's a testament to you. With, with that being said, um, there's a lot of great questions that have come in through the chat. So I'll just go through these and you can answer them, please. Uh, first question, and there's a couple of these, so I'm gonna lump these together. Someone else voiced it slightly different. Hear, hear your question in this. I recently had a blood test. My fasting blood sugar was 10.3. Can I bring it down with diet and exercise? So the fact that your fasting sugar was 10.3 is, is diagnostic for diabetes. So therefore we do know that you have diabetes. So can you control it? Well, the answer is yes. You can control it with food choices, with physical activity, as well as with medications. Now, the decision point of when to initiate medications is one that you'll make with your team. And that fasting number of 10.3 sounds like a level where I would start medication while you're doing physical activity and food choices. Although I, I don't have the full picture because the A1C is also a very useful number to help make that decision. If that initial A1C is greater, is 8.5% or greater, then we do start medication right off the bat. Like I said, it's not in place of diet and exercise, it is with, but it's the idea of let's protect you and let's protect you from the beginning. And let's not wait around for diet and exercise to kick in. Let's do it together. And even if medications get started, remember, it doesn't mean you have to stay on the glucose lowering medications. 
It depends on how you respond. And I always promise my patients, I will, I enjoy stopping medication. So if it's appropriate to stop, I will, but I'm also not going to stop you prematurely and do you a disservice. And I think your team will agree and do the same. So therefore I say, yes, you, you have means of controlling it, but don't, uh, don't poo poo the medication idea as well, because it also has brings value to it. Oh, Lionel, I think you're muted. Thanks, sir. If there was a question on fatty liver disease, if you have fatty liver disease and you're diabetic, is it safe to take metformin? The answer is yes. Uh, and uh, I'm glad you brought up this question. Great question. So fatty liver disease is far more common than I think we realize. And it's often picked up by accident. Someone happens to have an abdominal ultrasound for whatever reason, and then fat is identified in the liver. I think in the past, we used to kind of go, oh, it's no big deal. It's just fat on the liver. But now we know it is a big deal. It's a big deal in that we need to pay attention to it. It is a marker of a liver that's not happy and that it can progress into something far more severe, including liver failure. So when we see fatty liver, we need to do something about it. But the good news is what we do about it is the same thing you're doing to manage your diabetes. Food choices, physical activity, weight loss, if that's appropriate, medications. Is it safe to take metformin? 100%. Is it safe to take a statin, a cholesterol lowering medication that really is there to protect your heart and reduce your risk of a heart attack? Absolutely. So yes, do not let fatty liver be a barrier to you getting the treatment that you need. And remember the treatment for your fatty liver is the same as the treatment for your diabetes. So it's a win-win. Amazing. Um, before we go on to the next question, I just wanted to bring it up to the audience. There is an evaluation in the chat while we're going through these Q&A questions, please go to that, fill out the evaluations, let us know what you liked, how we can make this better. We'd really appreciate that. So it's an ask, please do that. Uh, the next question we had is a very, very practical one. I have a first degree relative with type two diabetes. At uh, what age should we begin screening? Great question. So that partly depends on, um, on ethnicity as well. So if, um, there are certain ethnicities that are particularly high risk. So for example, our, our indigenous population, particularly high risk, uh, South Asian population, particularly high risk, uh, East Asian population, I'm pointing at myself, <laughs> East Asian population. So therefore, uh, in those populations, I mean, that screening could really start taking place in, in one's 20s. And, and it's, it's a single blood test, right? You can do a single blood test in your 20s. And if it's totally normal, okay, you could repeat that test maybe in three years, two to three years. But what you don't want to do is go 10 years without repeating the test. And both Dr. Neronia and I have patients where uh, they have not seen a healthcare person for 10, 15 years, and then they show up with their diabetes for, for the first time. But we often know they've likely had it for 10 years. But because regular blood tests wasn't happening, because they were not going to see any healthcare professional, uh, it was undiagnosed. So, and to me, it's a shame because that's a missed opportunity. Right? It's a missed opportunity to, to make a difference and to make a change. And one thing I failed to mention is that we know that the earlier one intervenes with diabetes, the earlier one controls things, the better off one is long term. So that's why I often say that people like Dr. Neronia, as a primary care specialist, is in the best place to make the biggest impact. Because often by the time someone meets me as a diabetes specialist, they've already had their diabetes for many, many years, and things may have already happened. But uh, Dr. Neronia gets to diagnose it. And therefore, um, him with his patients can really make a, a huge difference about the future. Thanks, Dr. Chang. A quick share on that. And you had alluded earlier that diabetes can be very much an asymptomatic condition. Um, I remember, and this happens once every few years, maybe someone who hasn't seen me for, as you said, 10 years or so. I inherited a patient, and she's a lovely lady. I did her history, I ordered blood work, and two days later, I get a call from the lab at 11 o'clock at night. Now, we as physicians love those calls. Her blood sugar is 20 plus. So you, I called her right away, how are you feeling? You're fine, see her the next day and go on to treat her. But the point of this is her A1C, her overall indicator of control was extremely high. She had had diabetes for easy five, six years minimum, and she was asymptomatic. So it's, it's important to do that screening. I just wanted to throw that in as a primary care doc. Uh, another great question, if, if you can answer this, why is diabetes less in European countries? Um, it's an interesting question. I, I think it, it's partly genetics, 
Uh, and, and I wonder if it also has to do with the interventions that may already be in play within, within those healthcare systems. Uh, so yes, I think there's a genetic piece to it. I, I think the other ethnicities uh, from an evolutionary perspective, the, the genetics are such that fuels are stored in a different place. So for example, for Dr. Neronia and myself, uh, for our waist circumference needs to actually be lower than the numbers that I quoted earlier. Because when we store fat, we store it on our organs on the inside. And therefore, Asian, South Asians need to have a much smaller waist circumference. And that's genetically determined. Uh, so I, I think there's a genetic piece to it. And it's how energy is stored and, and the efficiency of energy storage. But I also think there's a piece about the healthcare systems themselves and how advanced they are and how much screening is already happening uh, and, and that kind of thing. Fantastic. So we, we, I think we have a gestational diabetic uh, attending tonight, which is wonderful. And, and she asked the very practical question, if I'm gestationally diabetic, is there an increased risk for my baby? So for your baby, uh, well, let me answer it two ways. So the reason we control your sugar during the pregnancy is to avoid the baby getting too big. Now, normally you think big baby, isn't that good? Big baby, healthy baby, but no, not really. So too big is no good. It's no good from a development perspective and also from a delivery perspective. So during the pregnancy, we wanna treat you to control size of baby. Now, once baby is born uh, and actually during delivery, we want your sugar to be controlled because if your sugar is high at delivery, then baby can actually have a low sugar when he or she is delivered, like the, the moment of delivery. So baby will have blood sugar checked. Now future diabetes for baby is not increased because of your gestational diabetes. It is not increased, okay? What is increased for future baby is type two diabetes risk, but that's because you have an increased type two diabetes risk. The very fact that you have gestational diabetes means that your pancreas can't quite keep up with the demand of pregnancy. Therefore your future risk of type two is higher. And because it's genetically driven baby as well as an adult, would also have a similar risk. So no, the fact that you have gestational does not have immediate risk to the baby of diabetes as a kid. It's more just the future risk of type two. But the most important thing for you to remember is though, is that you can change that trajectory, right? So the fact that you have gestational diabetes is a wake up call. It is a, a it's actually a welcome wake up call to say, hey, my pancreas ain't completely normal. What can I do in the future to reduce my risk? And it's those very things we talked about, food choices, physical activity, and maintaining a healthy body weight. Amazing. Um, very practical question. Does menopause have an impact on diabetes? Yes, it does. It has an impact on blood sugars in that uh, with menopause, there may be some weight gain. Uh, it's a little controversial how much weight gain can one truly account to menopause. And uh, there have been studies that have been done to try to answer that question, but it's hard to tease out all the different things happening at the same time in life because age is another big predictor. But yeah, that may affect weight gain, which could therefore affect um, the de development of type two diabetes. Uh, and then also if you already have diabetes, uh, hormones can definitely affect blood sugars. So before a period, during a period, you get different hormones, different blood sugars. And therefore with menopause and the stopping of periods, uh, you can also then get different sugars. But the good news then is it's stable though, because you're no longer doing the cycling that you did before when you were still menstruating. So yes, uh, and menopause can, can impact sugars. Wonderful. And um, a question, how much artificial sweetener can you use before it becomes harmful, if in fact it does? That's a good question. And, and I, you know what, I cannot give you an answer. This is where a dietitian would be super helpful. Uh, I, I can tell you that the, the harm, harmful of artificial sweeteners was really based on animal data and it's sort of rats and rodents being given massive doses, like, ma like multiple times human doses of, of artificial sweeteners where maybe that was a thing. So in other words, I'm not really sure what the human data are in terms of harms of artificial sweetener, but I, I would actually refer you then to uh, either Health Canada, which probably on their website would have a recommended dose or maximum dose, but I actually don't know the number for that. Lionel, I don't know if you know the number for that. Um, again, like it's a lot of the concerns are really about um, uh, one or two specific artificial sweeteners at mega doses that, you know, humans wouldn't really ingest and it's sort of cancer risk. Um, anecdotally, and sometimes it's good to just hear experience, even though you don't have absolute evidence to back it up. I, I do think artificial sweeteners may increase sugar craving, but that's just a, that's a personal guess. That's not evidence-based. 
Yeah, and, and there are some animal data to suggest that that may be true, right? Where they fed rats certain things and then ex different experiments. I mean, we're, we're, we're not mice or rats, but, um, but it is a, an interesting potential. Yeah. A great question on cholesterol. And it's the question was, can it be brought down by diet and exercise? And I think we could add in a secondary part to that. I, there's so much negative speak about statin medications like Crestor and Lipitor for cholesterol. What are your thoughts for diabetics in both these arms? So 80% of cholesterol in your body is made by your liver. Only 20% is consumed in food. So that ratio right there is a powerful thing to bear in mind. You cannot control your liver. You cannot change your liver. I cannot change your liver. <laughs> Dr. Neronia cannot change your liver. So your liver, whatever its programming was and however much it was meant to make is what it will make. The only part you have control over is that 20% from a food consumption perspective, which is why dietary modifications are usually able to give at the most about a 20% effect on the lipid levels. Now, in diabetes, we know that the risk of heart attacks and strokes are increased. And we know medications like statins have been shown to reduce heart attacks, strokes, and death, independent of the cholesterol level, that it has something protective that it's doing to the blood vessels and probably to the plaque. Because how does one have a heart attack? You've got a plaque, um, gunk sitting in your arteries. And when that plaque ruptures, when the surface breaks, that's when platelets stick to it and a clot develops and then it blocks that artery. So if we can stabilize that plaque so that it doesn't break, then we can also help reduce those types of heart attack or stroke events. And we believe that statins have properties that it reduces or it stabilizes that plaque and it also helps to uh, reduce the gunk in that plaque. So it's not just a cholesterol thing, it's a heart protecting thing and a stroke reducing thing. And that's why I, I present it as this is to protect your heart and protect your brain. And as long as you got a heart and as long as you got a brain, this is something you want to take. And okay, yeah, we're going to make your LDL look pretty, but that's not the main reason that we're offering it to you. Thanks. Um, really practical question again, uh, alcohol and diabetes, what, what are the limits? And when you answer this, I know it's a friend of mine who's asking. So if, he, if he's allowed alcohol, it has to be very good spirits and has to be had with me only. Okay. Of course, sure. of course, that's just a given. <laughs> Um, so the, the alcohol recommendations would be similar to what we'd say for the general population. So what is that? Seven drinks a week for, for women and 14 drinks a week for men. I don't really agree with the fact that it's different, but whatever. <laughs> but that's sort of what's, what's recommended. Uh, specific to diabetes, though, it, uh, remember that there are carbohydrates, depending on what kind of alcohol you're drinking. Um, alcohol itself can actually lower blood sugars hours after the fact if you drink lots of it. So if you're somebody who also takes insulin, uh, then just bear that in mind when you're dosing your insulin at mealtime, that if you have a lot of alcohol, you may actually have a low sugar many hours later. Uh, and then when you drink alcohol, you probably snack with it and eat stuff at the same time, which can then with it bring calories. And then the other thing to bear in mind is that alcohol are, it has calories in it. So if weight loss is one of your goals, then that may be one of the lower hanging fruits to, to lessen. So can you drink alcohol? Of course you can. Uh, stay within the numbers that's recommended for the general population, but bear in mind the calories, bear in mind that it can also contain carbohydrates and the potential for low sugar hours and hours later. Thanks, Alice. We're, we're going to do a few more questions and wrap up to be reasonably on time. There have been wonderful questions here. Um, sometimes the personal questions are, are, are really nice. My son's 21. He has an A1C of 5.85. He is at risk and his blood pressure right now is 150 over 98. Should I be concerned about his fasting sugar being 5.5, uh, et cetera. So the uh, fasting sugar does not sound concerning at 5.5, but I have to say that blood pressure of 150 over 90 in a 22 year old, I think you said, uh, that certainly needs to be addressed. And uh, your son should be speaking to his physician team about that uh, and investigated for why his blood pressure is high at that age. Um, it, it could be related to, I, I'm not sure about body weight, but it could be related to body weight, could certainly be related to genetics, but there are other sort of secondary causes that we need to rule out, like kidney issues and, and other uh, sort of the, the, the weird and wonderful, as we call it in medicine. So I think it's important that uh, he seek medical attention about that. Now, here's a question I really want to hear your answer to. Um, does diabetes need to be followed by an endocrinologist or is your family physician sufficient? 
uh, family physician family physician is sufficient that actually rhymes isn't it <laughs> uh, so the family physician is sufficient in uh, 90 in 90 of the cases the reason i say that is because type 1 diabetes i do believe should be shared care in a multidisciplinary team with primary care with a diabetes specialist whether that be an endocrinologist or an internist with an interest in diabetes uh, with um, a diabetes nurse, educator, a dietitian, the whole shebang. Care of colleagues of mine who are diabetologists, right? Like that's what they do and they do it well. So of course they can manage the type one diabetes. I think pregnancy diabetes needs to be part of a larger team with specialty care. Type two diabetes does not have to see a specialist. And then it very much depends on the comfort level of that family physician as to when it would be appropriate to refer. But I would say no to type two does not have to be Type one, yes, has to be, and pregnancy-related diabetes, yes, has to be. Excellent. Um, last, second, last question, um, and it's two part. I have to take a nap after I have my metformin, and secondly, if I only eat vegetables, I'm still hungry, and I feel I need meat. If you want to comment on those two, uh, I love meat. I have no problem with meat. Meat is protein. Protein is good. Uh, so therefore, for that person who eats vegetables and is still hungry, uh, please add some meat to it. If you enjoy meat, if you're a vegetarian, then add some other sources of protein. Uh, but protein, fat, vegetables, uh, those are kind of the sources of, of nutrients that are good for everybody. Carbohydrates are not the enemy. I mean, of course, you can have carbohydrate, but it's, it's about portion, right? It's about how much carbohydrate and, and the, the lesser, the better in the context of diabetes. And hence that, that hand thing, right? When fist versus the handful, that kind of stuff. Uh, but remember, even in, in, that, in that hand thing, the, the palm was for meat, right? Sickness of a deck of cards. So please have the meat. The metformin thing, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question. Uh, needing to take the nap after the metformin. Uh, sometimes, I mean, check your sugar after you eat because if your blood sugar is quite high after eating, and we tend to take metformin with a meal, if your blood sugar is quite high, maybe that's why you're sleepy in which case it's got nothing to do with the metformin, it's the fact that your sugars are high. So certainly test the sugar at that time to see if that's got a relationship to it. So last question, and then I'm going to wrap up. It says, does either metformin or insulin's long or short acting cause rapid weight gain? They actually put 30 pounds per month, which is almost impossible, you would think. Yeah, so um, I, I always say that insulin can be blamed for maybe five to eight pounds. Anything beyond five to eight pounds is not insulin. Now, when can that be different? When that can be different is if someone had lost a precipitous amount of weight because of undiagnosed diabetes, missing insulin, and they were losing muscle and fat because of a, of a very dangerous situation of that undiagnosed diabetes. In that situation, when you then replace the missing compound, which is insulin, the body stops chewing itself to death. Remember that initial di di description of diabetes from the first century, the limb and flesh sort of being flushed through the urine? Well, we're sort of reversing that process, giving back the insulin, allowing the body to burn the right fuel, and then therefore reaccumulating that muscle and fat. That's a different scenario. In those situations, yes, I see people put back on 20 pounds upon initiation of insulin, but that's a healthy 20 pounds to put back on because that's a 20 pounds they lost in a very unhealthy way. But anything beyond that initial weight loss, any further weight gain has much more to do with food and physical activity and not insulin in and of itself. So I think five to eight pounds for most people, except for that dramatic situation that I just described. If whoever is asking this is in fact experiencing this kind of precipitous weight gain, again, please see your team. Please make sure that you're on other therapies that can help you lose weight or can help mitigate the amount of insulin you're on. And also make sure you've seen a dietitian because what some people do is they eat for their insulin when we really should be giving their insulin to match the food. So maybe there's things that could be done to help. Excellent, thanks. You know, there were so many great uh, pearls from the talk and the questions and answers. Thank you everyone who, who put them in the Q&A, very much appreciated. But you know, a few things that stick out to me, one in 11 adults worldwide are diabetic and this is massively rising. This is a, a the real, epidemic of our time. You know, at home in Canada, 11.5 million patient, uh, people are diabetic or pre-diabetic. So, you know, we're looking at well over a quarter of our overall population. You know, 
what you reviewed very uh, eloquently, what is diabetes, the types we have, the ABCDEs approach. And we know, in fact, that there's great proof that the cumulatively optimizing these parameters, blood pressure, A1C, cholesterol, weight, smoking, vastly change the trajectory and the outcomes as you alluded to, Dr. Cheng. You touched on the proven benefits of certain medications and classes for reducing cardiovascular and kidney diseases and, and outcomes, and that'll be talked on more in, a, in a for, another coming talk. And you also talked on monitoring, which, which we'll talk on another talk. Very much, I think the one thing I'd like to leave uh, summarizing with is this is a team approach. One person, be it the patient, the endocrinologist, family physician, dietitian, it's a team approach. Um, and, and this is something that will change your outcomes if it's done well. It's nice to be laid back in life, but not with your diabetes. Be aggressive with it, be the driver of your care. Um, a few people asked, this is going to be recorded and available on the Diabetes Canada website eventually. So for anyone who wants to review it or take notes or let other people know, please do so. If you haven't, please do the evaluations. We value them very much. The next two talks very briefly, Tuesday, March 23rd, 7 to 8 p.m., Dr. Robin Holden, uh, an amazing endocrinologist, another chair of the guidelines. We're very privileged to have speakers like Dr. Chang and Dr. Holland. She will be talking about therapeutics, you know, what we can do medication-wise primarily. And then Saturday, April 10th, from 10 to 11 a.m., Dr. Andrew Steele, a brilliant nephrologist, and Ms. Laurie Bernard, Bernard uh, the diabetic nurse educator of the year in Canada, will be uh, jointly doing a talk on monitoring and the top 10 things a diabetic can, should know. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Diabetes Canada, Grace Leader, for her technical support. Uh, Dr. Cheng, you, 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 you surpass yourself every time I hear you. I enjoy listening to you, and I'd like to thank you on my behalf and everyone who's attended. And I'd also like to thank all of our attendees today uh, and your, for your questions. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a great night. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Neronia, for your efforts. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Good night, everyone. Good night.